Um, so we have Yukunwa and Ben coming up next to talk about Say What? Customizing Creative by Audience. Come on up. Pull these chairs over to the side a little bit so you guys can see the work when we come up. There we go. Sit. I don't care why you sit. This, I think, is more comfortable. Okay, cool. There you go. Hey, guys, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a creative director at Google. I run a group called Unskippable Experiments. We're doing experiments to understand the sort of future of content and how to make ads um, more effective. And it's um, my deep and abiding pleasure to be with Ikanwa Ojo here, who is the uh, senior vice president, runs CoverGirl in the US, and has a long list of accolades, which would take all of our time if I, I think I ran through them. The Financial Times, Ad Age, Creative 50, Marketing Times, Black Enterprise. I could fit it all in 20 minutes. I'm just going to go for it. Um, but I think the thing that's most exciting about this conversation for me is that she's led one of the um, bravest brand transformations uh, of, any, of any brand in the beauty space um, for CoverGirl. Uh, and as a part of that, we've been helping them run some experiments to understand how you customize creative and how much customization um, delivers how much value. So what my team does is design these experiments. We have a control um, and measure it against a control to see what change is worth it. And in this case, we were trying to answer this question. What happens when you combine audience signals with changes in creative? I think we're all talking about personalization at scale, like it's a universal good. But how good is it? And it's a lot of work if you're a creative. How much change um, is going to be worthwhile? So in order to understand this, uh, first I want to talk about CoverGirl, the brand, and uh, the tribe that you pulled together, which Fast Company and Odd Eye named um, Multicultural Bad Assery. Why did you select <laughs> these women, and, and what, were you, what were you aiming for for the brand? Awesome. Thank you, Ben, um, for the question. Thank you uh, for having me here today. Um, hi, everyone. Um, the biggest thing for us as we were relaunching CoverGirl, it was actually very connected to the panel that happened before, was that we felt like there was, um, women were leading very multi-dimensional lives, but from a beauty perspective, it seemed to be very one-dimensional or single-dimensional. Um, and that's that women have a lot of commas in their lives. Yes, they're moms, but they're also girlfriends, and they also love cooking, and they also love working out, and they also love motorcycle racing. Like, they have a lot of other interests. And so, as we were pulling together, we had the opportunity to choose our new tribe of cover girls. Um, we wanted to make sure that we were representing what culture looked like, so eth ethnic diversity was important. But to be honest, that's just table stakes. That's just representing the community that participates in your category. Category. The second for us was representing um, diversity in age and recognizing that there are several um, different ages of people who participate in the beauty category. So you know what? Like, let's celebrate that and represent that. Which to me, that should also be table stakes. But in beauty, we still have a, a ways to go in doing that. So we. Um, got, you know, Mae Musk, Elon's mom, is, is one of our cover girls, love her. She's the one on the far right. Um, so excited to have her. She's 70, and she looks better than most of us, um, which is amazing. She's been a model for 50 years. Um, and then we also wanted to celebrate vocational diversity. And that's what I was talking about earlier, which is we felt that a lot of the brand ambassadors in beauty only came from basically three lines of work. There were models, there were singers, and there were actresses. And we just wanted to turn that a little bit on its head and the, recognize the fact that women play a lot of different roles in society and in today's culture even more so. And so for our new tribe of cover girls, we wanted to represent Shalina Moreda, who is a motorcycle racer and the first woman to race the Indy Raceway. We talk about Aisha Curry, who is not just running one business, but several businesses successfully, and also being a mom, and also being a wife. Um, we love that Mae Musk has two MS degrees, and she has been a model for 50 years, and also gave birth to like three geniuses. Um, <laughs> then we have Issa Rae, who's a director and a producer and a comedian um, and really is a, new, a voice of a new generation in entertainment, who actually got her start on YouTube, actually. Got her start on YouTube. Yeah. And then Masi Arias, who's a fitness um, 
who, um, who's the fitness guru who will literally kick everybody's butt in here together. Um, and if you don't follow her, you should, because she will literally um, challenge you to do things that you thought were impossible. Um, so we loved having a very diverse um, group of cover girls to show that you know beauty comes in a lot of different dimensions. And the more that we can bring that to the forefront, the better. So I feel like what a lot of brands do is they put the table stakes out there, they make their print ad, and they're like, hey, we've done this thing, and so aren't we great? And they tell the stories in very traditional ways. So I think the first thing that you guys did that um, really surprised me was not just, hey, we have this incredible diversity of vocation, age, et cetera, but use very non-traditional targeting to try and reach those women. Um, tell me a little bit about why you went away from beauty mavens. What did you aim for? What did you find? Yeah, um, our perspective was because a woman loves beauty doesn't mean she doesn't like anything else, <laughs> which is kind of basic, but that's not how we were buying media. Um, we assumed that if we wanted to talk to you about beauty, we had to get beauty enthusiasts. But the reality is there are a lot of women who are cooking enthusiasts who love beauty. And why have a chef in Ayesha Curry if you're not going to leverage her in her full potential as a chef to target women who love cooking or women who love auto racing. They think Shalina is a total badass. So why not leverage Shalina as an awesome woman to talk to them about beauty versus only targeting people who've identified as beauty enthusiasts. So it really came from a place of recognizing that women have a lot of commas. We have a lot of interests and about 80 something percent of us participate in the beauty category, which is like all of us. So if you have a heartbeat and you love makeup, you have an interest other than makeup. And so that's such an awesome way to, t to reach you and to tell you a story that could be relevant to you. Um, so yeah, we did that and we actually found that that performed even better than targeting just on beauty alone because the women leaned in a little bit more, the participant leaned in a little bit more because the content was even more relevant to them. Um, so it was the highest performing um, ad that we had run on YouTube and Google ever. Amazing. I can say with some confidence, you're probably the first beauty brand who tar targeted auto racing and then <laughs> amazing to have found the results. Um, so this, I think, was the first step that, that, that uh, CoverGirl and Google took together. And the next step was to say, well, we found these women. They have these other interests. And how about if we speak to those interests in creative, right? What, what difference does it make? And, and what are the signals that are going to make sense there? So the structure of these experiments is always the same. We have a control, in this case, a generic ad made from the footage using the brand marks and targeted against a demo. So you understand the baseline. It looked like this. Like. Cover girl. I am what I make up. Right? Six seconds. Six seconds. All six second ads, all from existing footage. And then the structure of the experiment was three creative variations. The, a generic creative variation, one where we changed the copy based on the affinity signal, and one where we changed the visual end copy based on the affinity signal. And then three different layers of signals, all also non-traditional for beauty. So affinity for fitness, um, a life event, which was a new job, so people who were in job transition, um, and people who are in market for dating apps, which are all occasions where you can see a case there would be beauty, but they're not beauty mavens. They're not about beauty. It's not how-to beauty or beauty content. And so we really didn't know what was going to happen, right? Put them out there and see. So you can take a look at the creative. This is for fitness. So here first is the generic ad. Cover girl. I am what I make up. Right. I am a gym unicorn. It's just a line associated with the affinity, but exactly the same footage as the generic. And then this where the, where the line and the visual are changed. Cover girl. I am what I make up. And then the same thing for the other. So here's new job, right? Just the visual and copy change. Cover girl. I am what I make up. And then in market for dating. Cover girl. I am what I make up. So before the big reveal, what did you think would happen? What were you expecting? Um, I think the hope for every marketer is if you are more relevant um, to the person that you're targeting, that it would be more effective. So that was definitely the hope. Um, we put you know, quite a bit of effort to tailor, um, tailor the language or to tailor the creative to match the audience. So the hope is that 
when you bring all of that together, that it works to be more effective than your original. That is, that is the hope. So what did we find when we ran first? The, the uh, audience targeting outperformed the demo universally. Every single creative variation and the generics outperformed. So um, all of the audience targeting was worthwhile. All the different signals were, were worthwhile. Second thing we found, that the life event was the most impactful targeting signal that we had. And for me, this is in a lot of ways the most interesting finding. I think life events are a sort of moment of emotional transformation. A lot of things about yourself, your identity are called into question, a new job, looking for a new job. Um, it creates a moment of reflection and I think self-examination that makes you open to a different kind of story. And so for me, I was not surprised that the new job did well, um, although I thought that the dating app was going to do well. I thought mm -hmm. the emotional urgency of that and the specificity the of that. Uh, That's awesome. Well, I guess that maybe it's my dating <laughs> life. I read too much. And when, when we did the workshop with the folks at CoverGirl, we were all very excited about the prospect of that. Um, customized creative outperformed uh, in general, but especially with younger audiences. And the thing about that is interesting for me is maybe for a younger audience, 18 to 24, or 25 to 34, my expectation is, the, is that things speak to me more. I'm used to the world being tuned into me. And so I expect, therefore, that the messages are tuned into me also, right? A higher, a higher bar for a younger consumer than an older consumer. Um, but the last of these for me as a creative was super interesting. That is, in some cases, uh, as in uh, life events, the creative that had the visual and copy change was more effective. Sorry, for fitness, the visual and the copy change were more effective. And for life events, just the copy change was more effective. Um, and I don't really know why that was. And you guys saw the creative. And so the first question is, is it a creative question, right? Is one creative simply better than the other? And that creative quality is always the first bar. But the second is, is there something inherent? How much change should I make? Um, and how much complexity do I want to take on to deliver these messages? And the fact that just a copy change was very effective, um, I think, opens up creative opportunity. But you're the one who's got to foot the bill for production. So how do you think about this? Obviously, there's a role for customized creative. But how do you think about what you're going to make moving forward? Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is we're actually encouraged by the fact that without additional production, we were able to get better effective ads with the exact same content. So I think the, the table stakes here is that with the content that you've already shot, taking into account the different life events that people have or the different interests that they have, just a copy change in your existing content, not even just changing the content, will make a difference and impact in market, which is I thought was really interesting. Um, and then the second was tailoring the visual or tailoring the, tailoring the visual and the copy. But all of that, those were all assets that we had in the can from the shoot. So we didn't go out and shoot anything else. So I thought that was really, um, that was really interesting. Obviously, investing additional production, it depends on the size of the audience that you're going after. If the ROI is worth it, then I would say, yeah, totally. Like, go out there and, and do a tailored shoot for the audience that you're trying to reach. But if you do nothing else, with the content that you have right now, you can have a better performing asset with what you already have, which is what we're trying to do, right? We're all trying to do more with less. Um, and so that was very encouraging that every single asset we tested outperformed the original. Um, so that, that um, has a lot of insight for all of us, I think. And, and talk a little bit, I mean, you know, you can't jump into a thousand variations. We did nine variations here. How do you think about sizing the audience and the strategic choice you would make to, when are you going to go over and to do a shoot specifically for a segment or an audience? When are you going to do an auto racing shoot or how do you think about that? Um, lucky for us, we have Shalina, so we, we do auto racing shoots all the time. So I, our shoots in beauty have changed, right? Because now we're shooting a woman on a motorcycle, which is actually a lot more fun to shoot than in a studio. Um, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, I think the, the biggest thing is, like, what's the size of prize? And I think as business leaders, we do that all the time. If you're going after a new audience, you make assumptions and, like, what percentage of that audience do I think that I can convert? If I convert them, how many products do I think they will buy? What's the average price? You figure out the, the size of price for that. If you invest X amount in production to be able to get that, plus the media that you're going to spend behind it, is the return that you're going to get greater than the investment that you're going to put in? If it's greater, then I say go for it. There's no reason why you shouldn't change the way that you look at production and the way that you look at creative um, based on that. And if it's not worth it, then do this. Just 
work with the content that you have and tailor it a little bit more to their interests and to their life events, and you'll get a performing, better performing asset anyway. So the way that I look at it is you really can't lose. I would say, um, I just have to give a shameless plug. Yes, a copy line, but a copy line by the fabulous copywriters at Droga, who That's are some true. of the finest copywriters That's in the world. True. They're excellent, high quality, They're like great creative quality. They're pretty amazing. Um, how do you think about briefing? Like you got, you have this information, right? With assets that you have, you're going to have a new campaign. How do you think about changing the brief for, for, for Droga the next time around? Um, I think it's a lot of what we've talked about, um, bringing that to life in the briefing process. And when you paint a picture of who you're trying to speak to, and that person you're trying to speak to has a lot of commas in their life, bring that to life in the brief versus we're reaching all moms 35 plus. Mm -hmm. um, I have a lot of friends who are moms, I have a lot of colleagues that are moms, and we have differing interests, other than the fact that we all have a child, potentially, plus one. Um, and if you can go any deeper and give them additional insights on who this person is and what they love and what causes them to lean in a little bit further, where do they spend all of their time? If they're spending hours watching cooking shows, then even if you're selling beauty, you may be more effective leaning into that passion that they have. Um, so I think it means we do a little bit of work up front, understanding who we're trying to talk to and what really drives them and what moves them. Um, but then the work that comes out on the other end, I think number one will be more interesting to them, but then on the flip side will be more impactful to your brand and to your business. Um, so they have better content to watch and then you have a better impact on your brand. So hopefully that's a win-win. I, I will have to say, I had, I had two client meetings in a row today where the target was anyone with a mouth. And I thought, mm -hmm. I, thought I think we can do better than that, we right? I think we can tell a better story, a closer story, <laughs> um, et cetera. Uh, so that, uh, the gist of the experiment, thank you so much for that. I do, we do have a couple of minutes for questions, and so I want to open it up if you guys have questions for us. Any questions? People had I send, see, I just sent people scurrying for a mic. Yeah, questions? There in the back. A hot topic of conversation today has been um, the relationship between data and creativity. Um, so how do you take into account data when you're thinking of your next big ad? How do you take into account data when you're creating your next big ad? What's the role of data in the briefing process? So how do you guys think about that? When does it come in? Where does it come in from? Who do you look for it from? Yeah, um, so we have, we have a lot of data internally. Um, we actually have an in-house um, digital agency called Beamly. Um, so we're kind of data geeks, to be honest. Um, I think a lot of CPG brands are, but we are particularly so because we have a lot of um, tools available to us. We have a lot of tools with our partners, like with Google. So we're data geeks in that um, perspective. But then on, um, from a partnership perspective as well, we're very fortunate to work with um, Droga5, and I don't know if you guys have ever worked with um, Droga, but their stra strategy process, before you even talk creative, they go so deep on the insights and the data um, that drives the work. It's incredible. Um, so we actually don't talk creative or creative brief until we've completely geeked out on who we're going after, why we're going after them, what's the motivation, what's happening in culture, why is it going to be relevant. That's where we spend the most of our time because we've realized that when we get that right, the creative is so easy. We don't spend a lot of time in rounds. We don't do rounds and rounds of creative. We spend the time having the smart conversations up front. And when we get that right, um, the creative really just like falls out of that. It's like butter. I think the interesting thing about the load of creative that we have um, is a lot of times people use it to avoid risk, right? Like I've delineated a totally safe territory where uh, now I can only do a thing that'll definitely work. And I don't think that that kind of data analysis ever gets you to a Shailene Woodley, ever gets you targeting auto racing for beauty. So how do you use data to take risks? Like how do you feel like this is going to steer us in a direction where nobody else is, is steering? Because you know that what you're doing is relevant. Um, and so... Yes, it's a risk because you've never seen it in beauty, but it's not a risk because a lot of people have raised their hands and said they're really interested in that. So if you tap into the insight that already exists in data, I actually think that that's less risky um, versus showing up as every other beauty brand and then you're struggling to cut through. 
um, I think it's more powerful to actually look at all of the interests that people are raising their hands saying they're super jazzed about and tapping into that. Um, I think there's more opportunity for upside there, definitely opportunity to stand out. Um, and we've seen the benefit of that on the brand and on the business. Awesome. Thank you so much, cool. Conway. Thank, thank you guys all for coming. Enjoy the rest of Con. Thanks.